In this video, I hope you'll join me to check out United Airlines' world-famous island hopper. It's a quirky flight dating back 40 or 50 years that connects five Pacific islands with Hawaii and Guam. During the course of this video, I'll share some unique facts, history, and pictures from this very special flight. But first, I'd like to give a quick shout out to Audible for sponsoring this video. If you head over to audible.com slash Jeb, you'll get a free 30-day trial, one free audiobook, and two free Audible originals. I find Audible to be a great tool in my personal in-flight entertainment collection. In fact, on this flight in particular, I enjoyed listening to a book while enjoying the unbelievable views at the same time. So head over to audible.com slash J-E-B for this great offer. And you can also text JEB to 500-500 to activate this offer from Audible. Again, thanks to Audible for sponsoring this video. Hello, fellow travelers. I'm Jeb Brooks with greenergrass.com. It is 5 o'clock in the morning in Guam. I got in late last night from Honolulu. A direct flight would have been about eight hours. I chose instead to do it in about 15. You see, I was on United Airlines' world-famous island hopper that stopped at five islands between here and, uh, and Hawaii. It was an incredible experience, a feat of endurance. I tell you what, I haven't slept as well as I did last night in a long time. I can't wait to share all of the stops and uh, the history and um, what it's like to fly this route uh, with you over the course of this video. There's a lot to come. But first, let's talk about who's on board. Generally, I found there were three types of passengers who take advantage of the flight. First are those who live and work on the islands and need to travel between them or to the mainland. Second are U.S. military contractors or Department of Defense employees who are traveling to Kwajalein for the most part. More about them later. And third are the aviation enthusiasts like me who simply want to experience this unique flight. Most passengers don't fly the entire way to Guam in one day. There is a direct flight for that. but. If you're in this category, a direct flight just won't do. It was about 6 a.m. on Monday when I arrived at Honolulu International Airport. But in Majuro, our first destination, it was already 4 o'clock in the morning the next day. The first four and a half hour leg would carry us across the international date line. Passengers traveling the entire way get five separate boarding cards. Now, that early hour called for a visit to the United Airlines Club, which offered plenty of carbohydrates, important on the front end of what would turn out to be quite a marathon. I enjoyed a cup of coffee and ample seating, along with a great view of one of United's triple sevens. As the sun rose, it was time to find my way to the gate, but not before stopping for a few more snacks. You see, meals are only served in the first and final leg of the scheduled 14-hour service. It would prove to be important to have a little bit of extra sustenance. Uh, this flight, 154, once again bound for Micronesia with the first stop in the uh, 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 Montero. As a business class passenger, I boarded after families traveling with children, people with disabilities, active military members, and premier 1K members. When this 737 is used on a domestic route within the United States, this cabin would be labeled first class. But since this is an international flight, the same seat is considered business class. And we are just finalizing the load of your luggage, and we shall be on the way. Welcome on board. We'll talk to you again once again. The pilot spoke too soon. The first leg of this flight was scheduled to take four and a half hours, but was delayed before we'd even pushed back. Unfortunately, a passenger checked a bag which was loaded onto our plane, but then he failed to show up, so the bag had to be removed. The whole process took about an hour. My seat, 4F, was comfortable with 38 inches of pitch and a seat that's about 21 inches wide. The in-flight entertainment is controlled by that remote control. There's also a drinks table right here in between the two seats, and a pre-departure beverage was offered. I chose to hydrate with a little bit of water before takeoff. And if you're an aviation enthusiast like me, I hope you'll consider hitting the subscribe button and the notification bell for more videos like this one. 
Today, we'd be taking off from Honolulu's famous reef runway. The first leg of the flight is the longest. The cabin crew who traveled with us on this leg from Honolulu would hop off the plane in Majuro. They'd enjoy a layover before traveling on a flight back to Honolulu. We, on the other hand, would pick up a new cabin crew who'd take us all the way to Guam. Things were handled a bit differently with the pilots, but more about them later. Back to those cabin crews. Both were extremely friendly and seemed genuinely excited about the flight. They brought a sense of fun I rarely experience in the air with a mainline carrier. But the fun is more than I could say for the in-flight entertainment system. It barely worked. To be fair, this is the only leg passengers can really use it since it resets after each landing, and the rest of the flights are simply too short to watch anything. However, when it did work, it would only show previews of movies. I think this was a one-time problem since the crew gave us a link to use to request some miles or a refund of some kind. Unfortunately, that link did not work. Breakfast was served on this leg, and this would be the only meal we'd see from the airline for about 10 hours. Breakfast on a plane is usually not the best meal, and this was no exception. But I don't think anyone books the island hopper for the food. Those four hours passed pretty quickly, thanks mostly to the anticipation of landing in Majuro. Pretty soon, we were on approach. Welcome to Majuro. Each airport along the way had fire engines standing at the ready. It's not only a requirement that they be ready, but that the entire fire crew be suited up as well. This is, of course, for safety, but also helps increase employment in these remote parts of the planet. Again, on this island, we picked up a new cabin crew. The flight crew would also switch out. The pilot and first officer were seated in seats 1A and 1B on the first leg, and the crew that brought us to Majuro would take those seats for the remainder of the flight while the other crew took over. 1A and 1B on these 737s are unique seats in the United System. Per the pilot contract, they recline 160 degrees, which restricts the airline from selling seats 2A or 2B. On a typical flight, it's possible to get off at each stop and sort of wander around the terminals, or at least what there is of them. Each one is really not much more than a room. There's a snack bar in Majuro where you could stock up on overpriced crackers to sustain you through the next 10 hours if you'd like. A mechanic also joined us in Majuro and would travel with us all the way to Guam in case we needed a repair en route. He'd also supervise the fueling at each stop. The plane is refueled after each landing just in case an island needs to be skipped due to weather or other conditions. The people working the island hopper are absolutely obsessed with time. On many Pacific islands, things run on island time, meaning they happen at their own pace, and that sometimes means slowly. Nobody seems to be in much of a hurry to make them happen any faster. Things are a bit different with United's 154 service, however. With limited facilities at most of the stops, it would be unfortunate for the crew to time out somewhere between Honolulu and Guam. And with that hour delay we had at Honolulu, we were making up time the entire day. This is the continuation flight of the island hopper from Majuro to Kwajalein. A short 46 minutes in flight. Weather should be uh, good. We'll be ready to go here in the uh, next few minutes. Once again, welcome aboard.
soon we were on our way to Kwajalein and given some stale almonds. Because Kwaj, as it's known, is an active U.S. military installation, it's the only stop at which transiting passengers are absolutely prohibited from deplaning. Which is too bad, because it's also home to the largest lagoon in the world, at about 840 square miles. It would have been nice to see that up close. Anyway, the, uh, the Japanese turned Kwajalein into a military installation in the 1930s. Then, after World War II, the United States used it as a missile test range. In 1983, the U.S. and the Marshall Islands signed a Compact of Free Association, which gives the larger nation the responsibility for the defense of the smaller one. Today, the island is used for surveillance and identification of satellites, space debris, and missiles. The United States leases 11 of the Marshall Islands for some $18 million a year, most of them for military purposes. That lease expires in 2066, and unless you've got permission, you're not getting off this plane at this stop. In fact, we were even instructed not to take pictures as we waited on the ramp. Welcome to Kwajalein. The 737s used in this part of the world only last about two years before they have to rotate back to the mainland for easier duty. The salt air just isn't good for the engines. It was even tougher in the past, though. Before the runways were paved, they were actually made of crushed coral, and the 727s serving the route were coated with Teflon to protect them from it. These flights were originally served by Air Micronesia, or Air Mike. Eventually, Air Mike became Continental Micronesia, which then became part of United in 2017. Now, this is some pretty special flying, and many pilots are drawn to the Guam base simply for this route. It involves some of the shortest runways in the entire United system. Here at Kusray, for example, the runway is only 5,600 feet, requires landing with 40 degree flaps and max brakes. In fact, we landed so hard, someone's shoe ended up in my seat. Welcome to Kosrae. Where we were greeted by a now familiar sight, another fire truck. One of the most interesting aspects of this route was watching baggage handling. On some islands, the ground crew used forklifts and pallets to load bags, and more than a few coolers. Apparently, locals take fish with them to Guam and bring meat back. The coolers, like the flight itself, act as a lifeline for these isolated islands. The hopper stops at Kosrae only twice a week, that's Mondays and Fridays, so we were greeted by some casual observers who enjoyed checking out the 737 on the stand. No surprise, there are no jet bridges at these remote airports. Instead, boarding is handled by these ramps, moved by a tug. Before long, we taxied out. We're on our way to Punape. Ordinarily, it's possible for transiting passengers to get out at each stop. Well, except, of course, for Kwajalein. But because of our delay back in Honolulu, flight attendants asked passengers to remain on board at most of the stops, unless they were getting out, of course. As I looked out at the breathtaking islands below, I really wanted to explore them in more depth. Fortunately, I'd be able to hop off soon. This is an amazing route for so many reasons, many of which you probably already know about. There's the unique nature of the route itself, the interesting history, beautiful scenery, but there's also the other people. Everyone is so nice. For example, frequent flyers often get to know the crews on board and, and bring fresh fruit to them as a way of saying thank you. In fact, between Ponape and Chuk, one of the flight attendants brought around a green tangerine. Apparently, another passenger had given them to her, and I'd never seen one, so she insisted I try it. It's now something I can't wait to taste again. The views on approach into Ponape were stunning. Despite the low clouds, it looked like a true tropical paradise. This mountainous island was what I always imagined a Pacific island to be. Ponape is one of the wettest places on the planet. Rainfall usually exceeds 300 inches a year. That's more than 7,600 millimeters. We were lucky to see a relatively dry Ponape. Welcome to Ponape. Ponape is a popular destination for divers. Unfortunately for us, it's time to head on to Chuk. Now, I've 
never gone diving, but even I have to admit, it looks pretty appealing down there. The in-flight entertainment still wasn't working, but again, who cares? This was the real entertainment. The islands around Chuk soon appeared and we began our approach into our final stop before heading on to Guam. Welcome to Chuk. By this point in the flight, we'd finally caught up enough time that we were able to get off of the airplane. A welcome opportunity to stretch our legs and understand the boarding procedure on these islands a little bit better. This truly was a marathon, and by this point in the flight, we were pretty tired. It was nice to be able to just stand outside right by the airplane while we waited for boarding to begin again. Five out of six legs down, let's go to Guam. If you do get stuck along the way because of a mechanical issue, Chook is the place for it to happen. And there's a hotel there. But soon, a man with a shirt that said security asked us to step inside. Uh, we will start our boarding at this time. We'd like to extend courtesy boarding to passengers with disabilities. If you need extra time in walking, climbing the stairs, you are welcome to board at this time. It's worth noting, and I'm not sure why, Nobody checked our boarding pass or asked for our passports. We were free to just get on when we felt like it. We did wait for our zone to be called, but that didn't seem to be a requirement. Back on board, the flight attendants offered a unique pre-departure beverage, freshly squeezed coconut water. On this final leg, we were given another meal. It had been a while since we'd eaten a full one, so this sandwich was really good. It was also time for a gin and tonic. Already packing, come with me. I'm not really asking. We'll get away to a place where we don't know. About to see. I don't think it's fair to rate this flight using my traditional Jeb score methodology. It's just too novel for that. Instead, this flight earns special status as a must have experience for aviation enthusiasts. As always, thanks for watching, and between now and the next time, see you in the sky. Welcome to Guam. I'm done living life with the lights out.